thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm, I'm very pleased I can talk here. Uh, my name is Mark Alexa, and I'm currently at uh, Berlin University. Um, this is the slightly modified uh, title of my talk, 3D Computers and Sketches, and it will uh, connect to the first two talks. Actually, there will be some overlap with the first two talks. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't uh, follow up on the promise that uh, Spike made in the first talk, saying I would talk about 3D printing quite a bit. I will not talk so much about 3D printing, but I will talk a lot about sketches, as we've just seen in the previous talk. Um, so let me start by showing you what I think will be the, the future pretty soon. So I think what we will see is that 3D objects will coexist as digital, digital models and as real models. And there will be a closed loop from the object existing as a real object, then being transferred to be a digital object, and then potentially going back to be a real object. And in principle, there is, there is not really new, nothing really new since we have computers. But, but recent technology um, is, is making this happening now. Um, let me talk a bit about the details of this and, and why I think this is a good overview and good introduction into the topic. So first notice that this part on the left has a, a long history of development. I, I would say roughly 35,000 years humans are um, not just perceiving 3D shapes, but also making 3D shapes and changing them. And there is actually some, um, some, some artifacts that show that, that humans do so systematically. They, they just don't, they're not just creating 3D shapes and they see what happens. They're giving each other instructions, right? They're drawings on, on walls of caves and give instructions what to do with these things. So, so cave painting is about 35,000 years old. In comparison, this side is roughly 35 years old, right, if you compare that. So no wonder that, that um, modeling 3D on a computer is not as advanced as it is maybe when we do it with our hands. I don't think this has anything to do with computers per se. It has a lot to do with how difficult 3D modeling really is. And I will explain why I think 3D modeling is so difficult. Let me, let me, before that, let me just uh, briefly explain um, why I think we are quickly getting into, the, into, into days and a time where 3D models are real and digital at the same time. And the reason is technology. And, and the reason is that we're pretty quickly catching up on, on these 35,000 years on the left. So early on, we had this idea of how to present content to 3D content to um, humans. And basically, we created images and we presented them on screens. So this is pretty old and is basically 2D. At this point, I want to make a remark that I think this coexistence of 3D shapes in, in real and digital form is only meaningful for 3D objects. It's much less meaningful for meaningful for 2D objects, like images and, um, and videos. And I think it's much less, less interesting for images and videos because I can present them to you on the digital device and there's nothing much lost. Right? I can take an image with my, my phone and I can show it to you and that's the image, period. Right? There is no advantage of making that real, not, not a real advantage. While if I'm looking at some 3D object, presenting it on a little computer screen and giving that 3D object to you is really different. And the ways you would interact with a 3D object are very different on a computer and for the real thing. So, so I think this coexistence is much more meaningful for 3D content on computers than it is for the content that we have these days. OK, so now, now here comes the technology we all know that, that makes this happen. It's on, on one hand, it's, it's 3D scanning devices becoming commonplace, like the Kinect. And, and maybe you've heard about Project Tango, which is bringing these 3D um, devices on your mobile phone. Google is behind this and wants that your mobile phone has a 3D scanner on it. 
And on the other side, we have 3D printing, which makes it very easy and commonplace, and everybody can have this in their office or in their homes uh, to, to get this digital object and make a real object. And also in terms of presentation, we have a huge leap just recently, and that's, that's devices like Oculus Rift that really present 3D content to humans in a much more meaningful way than, than we would do with like a small screen. So at that point, I want to explain why all this technology is not the solution and the, the problem persists. So I see a slide showing the Star Trek replicator in a lot of talks about 3D printing, explaining that this is kind of our dream and when we get there, we have solved all the problems. And I think we will have not solved kind of any problem. And I will explain why. So let's assume we have such a device and I can talk to it. Um, now, usually what, what, what these characters ask the device to, to generate is like a dozen objects, like Earl Grey tea, uh, Earl Grey tea, hot or something. And, and, and let's, let's try something else. So when I walked into um, this, this complex this morning, I've seen this statue, and let's say I want a copy of that. I could talk to the replicator and say, okay, give me a man, and it has kind of a weird, wavy um, coat, and he's holding in his right hand this, and in his left hand this, and, and, and okay, I mean, something comes out of the replicator, and I'm good, but this is easy, right? Then I take the next statue, now, what am I going to say, right? This is, this is hopeless, right? Even with this wonderful technology here on the right, I can talk to and I can generate any object, let's say at any size even. It's, I'm lost. And now you, can, yeah, now you can say, okay, you have the Kinect, just scan it. Okay, then I go downstairs from here and I have this object made of, of shiny metal and then I'm even lost with optical sensing. Right? So optical sensing will only bring me so far. So essentially, I think this is a problem of communication. And, um, and it's just that while we, while we can produce sound and we can receive sound, or I should say while we can receive sound and we can try to imitate the sound that we've received, and we have a device for that, um, the things that we see and they create mental models of shape, we cannot just communicate as easily, right? We have no output device for shape. And that is why humans um, used these tools for centuries, for, for, for millennia, to, to evoke the same mental model of a shape in another person's mind. And just notice that this, that this is very difficult, right? If I want to explain to you the shape of this statue we've just seen, I will, I will not be able to, right? I'm a terrible, uh, well, the, the, the word artist doesn't even apply, right? I, I draw terribly. I'm very bad explaining um, like 3D shape. I have no chance communicating that to you, right? And even, and here comes the difficult part, even if we agree Right? Even if I talk for an hour and at some point you would say, okay, now I get it, I have the shape in my mind, we, we could still think about completely different objects. So, so I think really the difficult part is getting this thing out of our head and I do think there is some value in looking at what humans have done, not, just, not necessarily copying it, but trying to learn from what humans do. So. The first kind of project I want to show is the simplest possible thing I can think of. So, what is this? Fish, right? <laughs> this seems like crazy simple, right? There is nothing simpler to any person above the age of, say, five. Yeah, I mean, it's like four, four. Three, if you have a gifted child, right? Maybe two, I don't know. But, but at that age, this is an extremely simple task. Now, 
can a computer do the same thing, right? And, um, okay, so here's the solution, just in case you, you were wrong. Um, as I mentioned, this is a pretty old task, right? And people used the fact that it's so simple for a long time. So this, this seems like it, it worked out of the box from the very beginning. So the question is, how do we recognize or better categorize sketches? So the goal should be, given these little shapes that you see here, what is this? And in order to work on that problem, we first uh, gathered some data. So here's our data gathering stage. We didn't allow text labels. So basically we gave people a category like blimp and then asked them to draw this. And, um, and they were not allowed to use uh, text labels. They were not allowed to use large black areas, so no shading basically, just outlines. And next, we didn't allow context around the object. So when somebody was supposed to draw a bar barn, they, they, they were not allowed to use other items to make clear that this is a barn. And lastly, we asked people to draw objects that are really recognizable which not always succeeded, right? So the, the right thing that you see there is supposed to be a bear. Which makes the task very difficult. And, and at that point, I wanted to mention, we often try to copy what humans can do, and we ask the computer to have a 100% accuracy on this task, forgetting that our own accuracy in these tasks is way below 100%. Speech recognition, for instance. my my accuracy at speech recognition is certainly not 100% in German, right? let alone English, or let alone French, which at some point my teacher thought I did well. <laughs> Funny. Okay. Um, so here are some of the categories. On the left you see fish, then there are some buses and some flowers. This is a small part of our data set. Um, and based on these shapes, we first try to answer the question, how well are humans actually doing? And for this, we set up another experiment and we asked humans, what is this? And they had to go through like a three-way hierarchy uh, to, to say, okay, so this is a monkey. And then we, we gauged human performance and we, for the data set that we generated, we um, arrived at roughly um, 75% recognition rate, which means given a sketch drawn by a human, good or bad, 75% of them were recognized as what they were supposed to be. Right? So at this point, it is, is obviously not meaningful to hope that a computer would achieve 100% accuracy. We would have done something wrong because we would have learned something that is not in the data, at least not for humans. So here's a data point. So this data point means um, this person worked on 250 sketches and achieved 85% recognition rate. It's just, this graph is just to show you that after some number of sketches, humans mostly agree at this 70, 80% recognition rate, right? Well, few hum humans who worked on very few sketches, the, the recognition rate is a lot more uneven. Okay, so here are some categories where humans do pretty well. Um, T-shirts like 100% recognition rate or snake, airplane, whatnot. It's more interesting to look into when did humans perform poorly. So here are some of the categories, and it's kind of obvious if you look at it that, that this is difficult, right? Seagull, for, for instance, I mean, differentiating a seagull from a flying bird or a standing bird or a pigeon, very difficult. One has to say humans knew that there were these different categories, right? When they worked their way through the hierarchy, they would first see something like animal, then bird, and then there were different kinds of birds. But it's, it's admittedly hard to distinguish between a standing bird and a seagull, right? What differentiates a seagull from a standing bird? Um, and similarly, like the bear and panda category are obviously having overlap or different things you can sit on. 
and so on. Okay, so, so now, of course, I mean, we didn't just, I mean, I'm a computer scientist, right? So we didn't just do that out of curiosity of, of how humans would perform. We did that uh, to feed that into a computer experiment. And of course, the difficulty is um, that all these things are fish. Now, what is it that they have in common? And Spike actually asked the exact same question, right? What, what is it that makes this a fish? And it's certainly not that it looks like a fish. Yeah, it, it looks, if you look at it, the geometry, I mean, you will not find a fish that looks like the, the one on the lower left, right? It's a very, I mean, it's a, I, I'd have sympathy for this fish, right, if it looked like that. Um, so these, comparing these things with real fish doesn't help. So, so overall, I mean, we, we looked a little more into this, the problem is that some humans only draw outlines, others use some decoration and draw interior lines. Some things are very abstract and are not at all like the real thing. Others are actually realistic. And more specifically, perspective is a difficult problem. Sometimes people are not using perspective at all and, and others are able to draw perspectively. So the goal for the computer is to come up with a way to measure the similarity of two sketches. So in this case, for these two sketches, we want the computer to tell us that they are very similar, right? And, and in this case, we want that the computer finds that these two things are very dissimilar. And okay, so here's, here's what we did. Basically, we, we do what Google is doing. We look for words and the little sketches are something like a document that is comprised of words. So on the right you see some words that we learned through a pre-process. So these things are words, these are parts of the image and now we're just counting words. So we go through the image and we say, okay, so this, this is a word and this is pretty much like the one on, on the top so we say, okay, so there's one instance of this word in this image. And then we go on, we find this part, and we say, okay, so this is like this word, and so on. Yeah, we find this part, we count this another one, another time. So here we say this is pretty much like the one on the bottom, and so on. We basically inspect every part of this sketch, and we, we say this has to be one of the 200, 500, 1,000 words that we learned from these sketches. And all we do is counting. And this basically treats the sketch as a document and creates a statistic, right? The number of occurrences of these different words. And then all we do is take the inner product of these, um, of these statistics in order to um, analyze how similar two things are. So two objects are very similar if they have the same histogram of visual words. And they're very dissimilar if they have very different histograms of visual words. And now for performance, it is interesting to note that most sketches have zero occurrences for most words. So these vectors are very sparse and, and you can compute similarity very quickly because you don't go over all the entries when comparing them, you only go over the non-zero entries and that's very fast. So I will show how fast it is in a minute. So then we have this task, computer is supposed to say fish and in fact it, it would do so for all these things. And obviously it helps that we restrict ourselves to 250 categories. So now we can compare how well the computer is doing as opposed to humans. And on top, there are a few categories where the humans, where humans and computers do almost equally well, right? Even for the hourglass, computers significantly outperform humans. And on the bottom, you see some categories where um, computers would do poorly and humans still do reasonably well. And now I can show you how this looks. So this counting of visual words you can do um, online 
and then the computer constantly makes guesses what this is supposed to be, right? And in the end, of course, I'm mostly showing positive examples here. Um, uh, in the end, computer has recognized this object as a monkey, and the second guess is teddy bear, and then other things that this could be, just looking at the numbers, right? Oops. So here's another example. So now it thinks it's a wheel, which could be what it's supposed to be. And then by adding some slices of salami, it becomes a pizza, which makes sense, right? Okay. You can also draw with your finger. You can also draw very badly, as this example shows. So here the guess is, is a lion. Yeah. <laughs> At least it's a four-legged animal, right? I mean, it could well be a lion. I don't know how, how close this is to a satellite dish, but you know. And finally, just showing how close these categories are, this is going to be a calculator in the first instance, and it's, it's going to be recognized as a calculator pretty quickly. Right, and when now we turn this into an iPod, some of you still might, might, might still know how an iPod looks. Um, yeah, it's a long time ago, I know. Um, so then the system really recognizes this as an iPod. So just for fun, we also tried the system on these um, sketches. So this is a flying bird, this is a camel, this is a, recognized as a sheep, and then you hear different uh, names for what this is, and this is correctly recognized as a horse. Now, I want to make one remark I was also asked to say, what are difficult problems for the future? So as I, I sh I've shown you, computers can reasonably well recognize these sketches, but they don't do it the way humans do. Right? They do it blindly. And a good way to see that this has to be the case is while we can do this kind of reasonably, we cannot do this at all. So here it's the reverse task. We would tell the computer, draw a fish, and we would ask that this is not just taken from a human. This is just not randomly choosing among human-drawn fish images. Right, which is simple. This is very difficult. So basically, we tried this for a few years and we gave up. So the computer drawing a fish that has not existed before and that still looks like a fish, and it's not just a, a simple, like, copying and pasting things together. Very difficult problem, I think. OK, now with that, with that technology at hand, let me go back to this image and let me show at least some things you can do with it. Um, and here's, here's one scenario you could look at, which is how can I create and change shapes and then manufacture them? So here's a little teaser video about this task. So this is obviously staged because there's no coffee in the cup. Um, The idea is that then you use sketching to identify the object, find it in a database. And of course, the object in the database is not the one you wanted, so you're going to modify it a bit. And then you send this modified design um, to a 3D printer, and then if you're lucky, it's actually watertight, and you can use it for drinking. We were not so lucky. <coughs> okay, so, so here's the overview of this task. Basically, first there's a query into a database, then there's modification, and then there's printing. Um, so let me first talk about the query. 
So here's the, the task. There is the sketch and now I suppose I have a big database with 3D objects which is what we do have these days and what we want to find in this database is a three-dimensional object that would reasonably fit what humans have drawn. Now, I guess what we learned from other projects is that it's a very, it's not a very smart idea, that's my belief, and, and sorry for those who are working in this direction, to try to infer three-dimensional shape from this outline, right? I don't think that works. What instead I think works much better is to infer outline from the three-dimensional shape that was in the database. Right? It's much easier to create a simple drawing from a three-dimensional object than it is to create a three-dimensional object from a 3D drawing. So that's what we do. We take all the objects in the database and generate drawings from different viewing positions like this. And there we use techniques that, that we've already seen that um, mimic human drawing. So we use existing computer techniques that mimic human drawing for creating many sketches from the three-dimensional objects. And then there's, there's one degree of freedom missing here. So there is rotation around the viewing axis or what is the upright direction and we also sample this. So basically, we generate random views of this object and suppose some, somebody has sketched them. Maybe as a side note, we've received some criticism that we probably generate many outline drawings um, in ways that humans would never do, yeah? like the horse from below. It's a very unlikely viewing direction, right? unlikely style for human drawing. Um, but we measured that and it doesn't really matter. So let's assume we do this randomly. And then with that, that's basically the only trick we needed, right? Now we can use the machinery that I've already presented and, and use this way of judging similarity and create, I mean, we look for these visual words in the two sketches, the, the computer sketch and the human sketch. We get these histograms and then we take in our products and then we have our similarity measure. And that's basically it, right? And now we can look for uh, 3D objects and databases based on these sketches. I also wanted to point out, remember what Aria said in his talk that they needed these little text labels because otherwise there's no way you can find stuff. So. I think that the truth is somewhere in between, right? I mean, it's true that some objects that are being sketched, you have no way to find anything reasonable and it's a lot easier with a text label. On the other hand, without asking for text, there's some other advantages, right? You don't, you don't, you don't require that the objects are actually labeled with some keyword and also it, it opens up the system to people who have difficulty with language, like young kids or, um, Actually, the, the rate of people who can't write is much higher than we probably think in, in like developed countries. Um, and even in developed countries, it's, it's, it's surprisingly poor. Okay, so these are the results we get. Um, so now we have solved this first part. We have a 3D object that is kind of close to what we want to draw, and now we want to modify it. And for this, we have developed something long time ago um, that looks like this. So what's the task here? Computer should adjust the nose to um, the drawing. And of course, this is not an image. This is a three-dimensional object. And um, so again, the idea is make it as simple as possible. And, and, and this, this works. Um, I can show you how. Let me see. How do I do this? Ah, okay. So essentially it's again about how similar are two strokes. So for this stroke, we just go through all the contours of this object and try to find the one that seems to be the match, which is the yellow one in this case. And then from that yellow contour, we find the sub 
the, the part of this contour that seems to fit this thing. And then this informs, um, informs us about the region that is being affected by this modification. And, and then this goes into some uh, least square solver. And, and this is the modification. Now, the, the last part is about the printing, and the printing, what it does, as, as, already, as also has been mentioned before, is a lot of constraints, basically. Right? It's, it's just not true that we can print any object just by sending it to the printer. And l let me just mention briefly a few constraints. One constraint would be, let's assume this grid um, is the... Um, marks the volume of the printer, right? Current 3D printers have a pretty small volume. So with your modifications, you don't want that the shape goes outside of this build volume. So you can probably want to constrain this in such a way, right? Next thing is self-intersections. You usually don't want that the object self-intersects before it goes to the printer. And um, this is an interesting problem in itself. I mean, printing or not printing. But inside this approach of making things fit for the printer, we also can easily solve for self-intersections and avoid them. Basically, it's a bit more than self-intersections for 3D printing. For those of you who are um, aware of how these things work, you need a certain thickness of the walls for 3D printing. So actually these, these two walls need to stay apart from each other quite a bit. Okay. So the basic idea is what we, what we so these are problems that are well known and there, there are solutions for them. What we do slightly differently here is we, we solve them specifically for 3D printing or layered manufacturing. And we make use of the fact that there are layers. So this is how 3D printing works. Basically, you generate um, this um, staple of different layers. And so what we can do during the modeling stage is actually we, we do slice the object before we even start with the modeling. And then we have constraints on these slices. That's actually what, what these printers have, right? They constrain the polygons that make up these slices. And as you modify the object, the system makes sure that each of the, slice, each of the slices um, satisfies these constraints. And that's relatively simple to do and also relatively fast to do. In that sense, it doesn't do any more than what we need for printing, and but doesn't do any less. Um, so this was just a, a, a brief mentioning of a project in this space. So I want to, um, towards the end, I want to, to use this picture again to say what I think we haven't really looked into enough. So there are these two realms, right? The, the way that we modify and create shapes, real shapes, and the way that we create and modify digital shapes. And it seems um, we mostly go this way, right? We, we look at what humans do in reality, and then we try to mimic this in the digital world. And I, I feel that the first two talks um, already mentioned that this is maybe not a very smart thing to do or at least not enough to really succeed. And we need to um, find a better division of labor. So I'm actually excited that we are all in agreement that this is not the case. But I wanted to mention something else. I think we are already at the point where we can start to go back. Right? We can take things that only so far work in the digital world and try to make them happen in the real world. And I think there are lots of exciting projects in this, in this area. I wanted to mention one that we looked into. Um, so 
there are techniques that are used on computers to make 3D shapes more recognizable. So what you see on top is on the left, like the standard rendering, and then by bringing out creases a little more, there, there are techniques for rendering um, that, that are supposed to make the shape um, easier to see and the features in the shape easier to see. And same for the golf ball in, uh, in the bottom row, right? Mm -hmm. These techniques mostly make use of the fact that in the digital world you can do things you can't do in the real world, right? So for instance, these projects assume that the light source is in a different spot for each point on the object. So for each point on the object, I say, okay, for you, you are being illuminated by a light source that this sits here, but you are being illuminated by a light source that sits here. And of course, that doesn't, doesn't work in reality because there's only one light that comes from whatever directions. So the question is, what of these techniques can we, can we bring into the real world? Or more generally, can we, can we come up with techniques that try to bring non-photorealistic rendering techniques, artistic rendering techniques, to 3D printed objects. And as I said, we have just started and the effect is subtle. I hope you can see that in this projection. So the bunny in the middle is the bunny, as it would come out a 3D printer um, if you just sent the bunny data to the 3D printer. And the bunny on the left and the right have been slightly modified to bring out the contours a little more. So there is no trick in the lighting and all objects are plain white, right? So this, we didn't print color on the objects. They're all just white. And my hope is at least for the bunny in the middle, which is the real one, and the bunny on the right, you see that the contours come out better. And we did this just by trying to modify, by modifying the geometry in a way such that we would hope that this effect happens. And I think this is, a, this is a fun space to look into, to not just look for exact shape reproduction, but for shape reproduction such that it generates the optical effect that you would want. Okay, and with that I'm done. I want to thank all the people who worked on this. It's obviously not just me. And last mentioning, on the App Store there's an app for your iPhone, iPad, whatnot device. It's called What's My Sketch, so that you can see if your seagull uh, is being recognized as a seagull or not as a standing bird. Okay, thank you very much.